Welcome back. So we're talking about compressed sensing and how we are able to reconstruct a full high resolution image or whatever signal we're, we're working with, audio signal image, from a dramatic subsampling of the information. So even if I only had a, a small number of random pixels from that image, can we infer what the uh, Fourier coefficients, the active Fourier coefficients in that image are in this vector s, this sparse vector s, and then can we use those to reconstruct the full image uh, in x? Okay, so we're gonna walk through now the math of how to do this. Okay, good. So this is kind of the matrix form, a pictorial form of this system of equations that I've written down here, okay? So psi is our universal transform basis. In this case, I think this is a discrete cosine basis, but you can think of it as some Fourier basis or some wavelet basis. S is my sparse vector of coefficients. Here, this is kind of a cartoon where there's only three uh, non-zero coefficients. Everything else is zero. So here, white is zero. Okay, uh, and Y is my measurement. So this C matrix here, what C is doing, this is my measurement matrix, it is basically pulling uh, rows of Psi times S. Psi times S is X, my original image. So C pulling rows of this basically means it's sampling pixels from X. So Y is just a uh, subsample of random pixels from X. Okay, that's what Y is. Now, this system of equations is what's called underdetermined. This is really important. This is an underdetermined system of equations. And we've seen this before uh, in the SVD chapter. We've seen systems that are underdetermined before. We have measurements of y. We know what c and psi are. We know which pixels we measured, and we know what our Fourier transform basis is. And we're trying to solve for s, the sparse vector of coefficients uh, that is consistent with those measurements. Okay, now there are, this y vector has only a few entries in it, and s might have a million entries, and so there are infinitely many solutions of this system of equations. There's infinitely many s's that when I multiply by c times psi, I will get back uh, this measurement y. And that's what I mean by underdetermined, is that out of all of those infinitely many s's, how do I find the right one that is actually the Fourier coefficients of my, of my image, okay? And so this is where it gets really interesting. And this, this is, again, this is an underdetermined inverse problem, okay? So, because we're basically trying to uh, invert y to solve for s. That's called an inverse problem. So this is an underdetermined uh, inverse problem. And so we're gonna have to use additional information. Out of all of these infinitely many s's, we're gonna have to use additional information to find this very special particular s uh, for, you know, in our Fourier transform basis. Okay, now if you had written down this math problem, you could have written this down 100 years ago, and people would understand basically what you're trying to do, but you wouldn't have been able to solve for this S. Finding the very particular S uh, that satisfies this equation that happens to be the sparsest S in your Fourier basis, people wouldn't have been able to solve that problem. It's called a combinatorially hard problem. You'd literally have to try all combinations of entries to try to find the sparsest S that satisfies the system of equations, okay? And it's only in the last 15 years that huge advances in applied math and statistics have given us algorithms to solve for the sparsest S, the S with the most zeros, that satisfies this equation in a scalable, robust fashion. So uh, there is great work by Donahoe and Candez and Romberg and Tao, uh, Baruniak, Trop, many others. There is a huge literature on this starting in the kind of early 2000s, like 2004 to 2006, that developed the mathematical framework to solve for the very particular S that we're looking for out of this infinitely many solutions. And the S that we're looking for, we want the sparsest S. So solve for the sparsest S out of all possible S's that you could solve for. And remember, that's based on this fundamental observation that all signals are compressible in these universal transform bases. So X, when I, for, when I Fourier transform it, is going to be ultra, ultra sparse. So what I'm looking for is a vector S that satisfies this system of equations and is as sparse as possible. 
Good. Okay, so there are many, many ways to, uh, to solve for s here. And I'm just going to write down a few different ways of writing this optimization problem and then show you what this looks like. Okay, so what I could uh, write down is I could write down that we're trying to minimize, uh, we're trying to find s that minimizes c times psi times s minus y. Uh, and we're going to try to minimize this in the two norm because I just want uh, I want y and c times psi times s to be as close as possible. Um, and effectively, I want this to be zero. I want to find s that exactly satisfies this. But remember, there are um, infinitely many s's that satisfy that. And so what I can do is I can add on this penalty term. So there's some constant lambda, just a number that tells me how important this next term is, times the norm of s. And what people have done a lot in the past is you would put a two norm on this s. And this is, uh, this is what we did when we looked at the singular value decomposition for underdetermined systems, is we solved for the minimum two norm uh, solution of the system of equations. But when you solve for the minimum two norm system, this is what you get. Okay, so this is the s that has the minimum two norm that satisfies this system of equations, uh, c times psi is theta here, okay? And notice that S is kind of dense. It has a little bit of energy in all of its entries. And that's what this two norm does. The two norm spreads out uh, the error in the, the entries of S so that you have the smallest radius possible, but every term is active, okay? And so this S most certainly does satisfy this system of equations, but it's not at all sparse. It's not the solution that we want. Okay, and so instead of doing the two norm, what we can do is put in this one norm here. Okay, and the one norm I'm going to tell you all about the one norm later. Uh, but what the one norm does is it promotes solutions of the system that have as many zero entries as possible. So when you solve for the minimum one norm solution, this is what you get. You actually find the original solution S that is as sparse as possible. So if you're looking for solutions S to this system of equations that are as sparse as possible, this is the kind of optimization that you want to be solving. You want to minimize the error in the fit. We know C, we know Psi, we know Y, we're solving for S, such that S has the minimum one norm. And that's going to give me the sparsest possible solution, and that's going to allow me to solve, uh, solve this problem uh, in, a, in a convex optimization. So, okay, I'm going to point out a couple of other things. This is really important because this is a convex optimization problem, which means that it's not combinatorially hard. Uh, it, even when your problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger, even when this matrix and this vector get bigger and bigger and bigger, this scales efficiently with Moore's law. So the, the, you know, the bigger the problem you have, you can just wait for computers to get faster and you can solve those bigger problems. Whereas before, solving this, uh, this optimization problem was combinatorially hard. If you double the size of your problem, it might take a million years for your computers to get faster uh, with Moore's law to solve it. Okay, so I'm glossing over a lot of stuff here. I'll tell you more about kind of what I mean by convex optimization and combinatorially hard and Moore's law and all of those things later. We'll talk about that. But what I want to point out is um, the problem we actually want to solve is the minimum uh, zero norm because the zero norm of S literally counts how many non-zero entries there are in S. But this is not convex. You can't solve this efficiently with computers. And so the big advance in that, that early 2000s I was talking about is showing that if you replace that with a one norm, with high probability, this will converge to the sparse solution uh, that we actually want. Okay, so that's really the big idea here in compressed sensing is that we're going to find the sparsest solution to this underdetermined problem using L1 regularized optimization. There's other ways you can write this. Um, I'll just write down one more for you before I go. You could also write this as uh, minimize the one norm of S such that this uh, C psi S minus Y equals zero, the two norm of that equals zero. Okay, you could also minimize this um, S1 subject to some constraint uh, on this being true. Uh, 
And in many cases, if you have uh, some measurement noise, so y is not exactly c times psi times s, but there's some measurement noise, this might not be exactly equal to zero. And so you can say that this uh, has to be the minimum one norm subject to this error being less than some epsilon or some threshold, okay? So um, takeaway here is that there are lots of ways of writing this optimization problem, and the L1 norm will promote the sparsest solution out of all of the infinitely many solutions to this underdetermined problem. The L1 norm is going to give us the sparsest solution. And remember, just to take a step back, that S is my vector of Fourier coefficients, which we know is sparse for natural signals. So once I solve for this sparse S, I can reconstruct my full image just by inverse Fourier transform. Okay, it sounds like magic. It is absolutely not. There are rigorous conditions on uh, what kinds of measurements you can take, how many you need, uh, and when this optimization will and will not converge. So that's all coming up, uh, and then we'll code this up in Python and in MATLAB. Okay, thank you. <laughs>